Well, good evening, LCM. Good evening. Tonight is going to be fun. We're going to get a chance to do what most of the world does not get to experience. And we've already experienced what most of the world doesn't get a chance to experience on a daily basis. We've gotten to get into the presence of our King and worship the living God as one family. We've gotten to hear His voice already, and we are about to get into His Word. Man, it's a good day to be a Christian. We've been having some good times in our services lately. We've gone through messages like the regulator, where we have learned what it's like to take personal responsibility for what God sets before us. We then went through a message called Behave Like Men, where we learned about the necessity of being smeared with the holy mixture of God. Then after that, the following Thursday, we went through Luxury for Less, and we all considered what it looks like to pay the cost for the actual anointing oil of God on our lives. And then, last Sunday, last Sunday, we heard Turn the Page. Turn it. Did anybody else, every time that was said, hear like a strange saxophone going off? No. Some of you are too young for that. And technically I am too. I just like certain music. We learned in that message that we need to turn the page on our failures. That we are not to let yesterday's failures affect today. Church, God is leading this body to maturity in amazing ways. All you have to do is just listen to what God is speaking to this church. When I think of turn the page, you know, I just can't help. And Gabriel and I were considering how awesome things were in the 80s. Yes. You know, a time when men were free to be men. When it was okay to be a steak and potatoes kind of guy. When it was not frowned upon to have a mustache and a mullet and have yeah. a blue collar job. And you know, some of you who are actually alive and, you know, doing life in the 80s are thinking, man, is it that bad today that we're thinking the 80s was the good old days? But you know, let's talk about the music of the 80s. Like, when musicians actually played music. Instead of just pushing buttons on a computer to create sounds. Sitting in a lab somewhere and doing fast food kind of music. You know, when I think of the 80s, I think of a guy named Johnny Cougar, for instance. Oh, that, maybe that didn't do it for you. Some of you don't know who Johnny Cougar is. Maybe you might know him as John Cougar Mellencamp. Mm. And then he changed his name to John Mellencamp. Wonder why. To me, he sounds as confused as a homeless man under house arrest. And then what's up with the name Mellencamp, right? I mean, was he on Ellis Island from England? Like the guys, you're like, what do you do for a living? I'm a baker. Your last name is Baker. What do you do for a living? I'm a barber. Well, your last name is Barber. What do you do for a living? I have melon camps. <laughs> uh, not so sure about that. I am a grower But you melons. see, as confusing as that is, there's something good about a well-written song and a good songwriter. Yeah. And one of the songs that just has Gabe and I all excited lately, mm. is a song called Hurts So Good. Hurts So Good. In fact, the name or the title of our message tonight is Hurts So Good. Come on, baby, make it hurt so good. See, there's some truth in what an actual relationship is like to understand the level of love that sometimes it hurts, but it hurts so good. In an actual walking together with another person, there are good times. And then there are times that hurt. But because you love that person, it hurts so good. Tonight, we're going to coin that phrase in our walk. That sometimes it hurts, but it hurts so good. Sorry, Melon Camp, it's ours now. <laughs> well, do we want to jump into the scripture now before we get in trouble? I think it's appropriate that we actually get into the text now. <laughs> well, let's turn to Deuteronomy 7, starting in verse 6, and say it hurts so good when you get there. Bonus points if you sing it. 
Okay, maybe some of you shouldn't sing it. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to his fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Church, Israel was not the greatest, nor the best. And that was the point. Israel is still not the greatest, nor the best. That is still the point. This is how God chooses. This is how he picks his chosen ones. He picked them because they were weak. He picked them because they were few in number. Now, we're not just going to pick on Israel, itty bitty Israel over here. Let's think about our own lives. Take just a moment to think to the day before he called you and spoke to you. Now, we don't want to stay there very long, but... Were you the greatest? No. Were you the best? No. In fact, you were worse than nothing. You were an enemy of God, an alien and a stranger in the world, doomed to die and be damned to hell. Yeah. But the truth is, is we're still not the greatest or the best. It's true. We say, I'm a son now. And it's true. But he didn't perfect you on the day he made you a son. And now you are some picture of excellence and propriety and the very image of God that needs no correction. There'd be no point in that. The point and the reason he picked you on the day you were called is because you needed him. Yeah. Is because when he set you free and forgave your debt, you would want to serve him because you know you owed him everything. But somehow, after we're born again, we start to get ourselves into a little bit of an idolatrous, self-fulfilling cycle. That we expect ourselves to have accomplished something that the Lord has not yet accomplished in our lives. We expect ourselves to be a certain kind of way. We want to present ourselves in a certain kind of strength. And then when we find evidence to the contrary, we're mad at ourselves and God because it didn't live up to our own idolatrous expectation of ourselves. Oh, no. See, the Lord intends to perfect us. In fact, he will perfect us. But unfortunately, we want to be perfected now. The truth is, is your very real imperfection, your very real weakness is how God gets glory. This is why he picked a blind man in John 9. The disciples are like, who done it? Was it him or was it his parents? Now how you sin before you come out of the womb, I've never quite figured that out. Oh, God knew. But neither. This was so that the glory of God can be revealed. Do you love the verse? Do you love being blind? Herein lies our problem. We all want to display the glory of God, but none of us wants to be blind. We all want to display the glory of God, but none of us wants to die. So we continue to puff ourselves up and attack ourselves and get all twisted up in knots because we're not what we think we should be. And that was the point. The point is that he is perfecting us, church. He chose you because you were weak. What I'd like you all to do is take in a full breath of the Holy Spirit tonight. I mean, actually take in a breath. He chose you because you're weak, church. Say it with me. He picked me because I am weak. Because I am weak. Now, for the rest of this message, we are going to be encouraging. We're going to be uplifting. 
But there's a little bit of work that is required in our hearts to rest in the fact that he picked us because we aren't perfect. Yeah. And so that everything we are talking about as we move forward is designed to give God glory. Yeah. Every improvement, every step of progress brings him glory. We can't bring him glory if we pretend like we're perfect now and we're adding to our perfection. Yeah. We're not the dream team. We're more like the longest yard. <laughs> I know most of you ladies don't understand that term dream team, but I know Ad Elder Adam Cora does. You see, we as men, we love to get around and talk about like, what would be the ultimate dream team of the NBA? Like if we could put Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant and Kevin Durant and Shaquille O'Neal together and, well, they would be undefeated. I mean, they'd be the greatest thing we've ever seen. We like to talk about things that are already perfect and dominant in nature. And that is kind of the problem. We like yeah. to already be at the arrived goal. Tonight should be comforting. When you're thinking about how God sovereignly chose Israel, he did not choose them because they had it all together. He didn't choose them because they were more numerous or stronger, which means by design, his plan for the world is to work with the weakest, most brittle, most stiff-necked, most... Re you name it. Did you say redneck? <laughs> Yeah, unschooled and ordinary fishermen. You see, by design, God chooses these things. We would like to think that he chose us because we have something to offer already. That's not why he chose you. In fact, if you were already so strong and great, he wouldn't have chose you. You know, Justin, I gave so much up to follow Jesus. <laughs> I mean... I was doing so well in business. I was so respected. It was really a sacrifice to lower myself and follow the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds bad coming out of our mouths, but let's be honest. We have that in our heart quite a bit. You know, I, I just am so humbled that I get to give this word to my brother. Do you know? The Lord chose me to give this to him. I mean, I worked really hard to make sure every word of this was perfect, that there would be no part of it that could be disagreed with. I argued it out in my mind three times before I shared it with him. And it's really all about the Lord, and I want no glory for how well it went. Yeah. See, ch Aye. church, we can, we can rest in the fact that even when we do that, even when we try our hardest he picked us because we're weak <laughs> there's still imperfection even when we go after it the hardest that we can and when we can operate from the right view from the Lord how the Lord sees us then we can actually take great comfort in his sovereignty we can be excited about progress and we can be honest about where we need to grow yeah, yeah. now that you know the origin point now that you know why God chose you Let's look at the end goal. Let's look at Exodus 19, verse 3 through 6. We're going to show you the origin point of God's choosing and the end goal where he intends to arrive his chosen nation or bring them to arrival. And then we're going to talk about the middle point. Exodus 19, verse 3. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. Do you hear that similar language, treasured possession, between this verse and Deuteronomy 7? Now look what it says in verse 6. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. The first thing you need to think about when you're listening to this passage is you need to understand how many times God is referring back to the Exodus moment. How many times in the biblical narrative God is hearkening back to that one singular event? How many times have you been reading a passage and God suddenly says to the people, 
remember what I did for you. Remember what you saw with, when I displayed my mighty arm and judged the nation of Egypt. Remember how you were powerless. Remember how I carried you. Do you see how many times God wants Israel to remember that? There's a reason for that. Because at the inception point of the nation, the very beginning of their calling, they had nothing to do with it. There was no strength that they possessed in and of themselves at all. It was totally God who caused it to happen. And if it was left to themselves, they would have never got out of Egypt. How many times are they arguing with Moses? It's your fault they're making us work harder. How many times are they looking at Moses and Aaron and saying, this is those guys' fault? Or thinking, you should stop saying these things to Pharaoh. It was God the entire time throughout the process demonstrating his ability to bring about their choosing. And that leads to the next thing you have to think about. God is promising them that he is going to bring them to being priests to the world. A nation of priests. So you really have to think about that. How is God going to bring the weakest, the fewest, the most feeble nation in the world to becoming a nation that represents him to the entire world? See, in the Torah, he lays out the beginning and he, leads out, he, he lays out what they are to become. So you have to think about what's in God's mind for a second. You have to gain an aerial view of what God is intending to do inside of these people. He already knows that they are the weakest, smallest, fewest nation. And he's going to bring them to a place where they are going to represent him and intermediate for the entire world. Do you think God knew what they would have to go through in between that process? I mean, do you think it really surprised God? That he would have to carry them like on eagle's wings throughout the process. He knew because he chose the weakest. He chose the weakest and therefore he knew what he would have to do for them. For them to achieve what he called them to be. In fact, if you want to read about that process. There are some fun passages like Exodus 13, 17. That when they left Egypt and they are headed towards the promised land. God did not take them on the shorter route. He didn't take them on the shorter route because he knew if they faced the Philistines, they would turn around and go back to Egypt. They'd be terrified. So he took them the long way. Hmm. But then in Judges 3.1, he leaves enemies there so that the Israelites must learn warfare. It's like right at the perfect time, he knows you're not ready for warfare. I'm going to take you the long way. And then he's like having... Having taken you the long way, I'm now going to leave enemies so you can learn how to fight. You see the process of an amazing, sovereign, powerful God working through the weakness of the people. So you have to think about yourself in light of that. Because this is the way that God chooses his servants. Oh man, how many times are your weakest moment actually God leading you into what you are becoming? How many times are your failures actually points of time where it hurts, but actually could hurt so good? Because you know it's bringing you to the place where you are becoming a priest like God intended. You see, God's not surprised at your weakness. God's not surprised with your failures. When, in fact, you can dig into the scripture and find out that Jesus Christ was crucified from the foundations of the world. Why would he have to be crucified? Because God knew that there were things that needed to be atoned for in your life. He knew in advance that when he called you, he was calling you with your struggles so that he can elevate you to a place where you are a priest of his mediating on behalf of God to the world. And he gets all of the glory out of your life and you get none for yourself. See, that kind of, oh, see, that's kind of freeing. Come on. That kind of takes the weight off of your chest a little bit from having to be perfect already. He knew what you were going to need. He knew where you were going to be. He knew the process that he was going to have to bring you into. And it's not a surprise to him when you stumble and fall. This is actually what God intended to get glory out of in your life. Man, I don't know about you, but that, that stirs me up. 
come on. The, the Lord bought a fixer-upper. He wanted to make a sleeper. I don't know if y'all have wasted time <laughs> like I have watching videos of a drag strip. No. <laughs> but when you see the 20-year-old in his daddy's Ferrari winning, nobody's impressed. In fact, there's, there's a little bit of disdain for that. And you'll get a man of wisdom like Elder Baj that pulls out like a Honda Odyssey that looks like it should be picking up the kids from the school and it dusts the Ferrari. It leaves it in its wake and there's some special satisfaction in knowing that vehicle wouldn't be able to do that unless the man made it that way. See, we are the Lord's sleeper. We are the Lord's fixer-upper. He takes great pride in the, what we accomplish. If you were perfect already when he got you, there would be no accomplishment in what he made you. We can rest secure in the fact that he knew what we were when he bought us. And so he knows what it's going to take to make us into what he said. We want to cover this in 1 Corinthians 1, starting in verse 26. Say, so it hurts so good when you get there. I promise I won't pick on you for singing again. Enthusiasm. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish to shame or in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. But God chose, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So that no man may boast in the presence of God. Wait a second. So what? No man may boast in the presence of God. Honestly, does any of us in the room kind of, bo kind of like to boast in the presence of God? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, I'm, I'm at this place already. I feel good. Don't you feel good coming to church when you've had a really good day in the kingdom? Oh, yeah. Like when you, when you gave a word to somebody and you got a word. But what happens if that, none of that happens and you feel bad? Mm. Might have a boasting issue. Might have a need to want to boast about your own progress, even to yourself or to God. Mm. The Greek behind this, and by no means my Greek scholar, uh, lends more towards the thought process of not many of you were skilled or cultured. Not many of you were mighty in your ability. And not many of you were high in rank. And, well, lack of skill, lack of ability, and low in status feels like pretty accurate descriptors of where he found me. This is how the Lord chooses. He says that he would take the low the foolish, the things that are not. I don't know where we get deceived into thinking that we were any more than that just now because we're participating in the process. If the Lord can make a donkey see an angel and prophesy when a man is blind, then he can do this any way that he wants to. Yeah. The fact that we get to participate in it is an extraordinary honor. Yeah. We have no boast. There is no boast. The only boast that we have is that he loved me. He picked me and he's allowed me to participate in his vision. He's allowed me to participate in his goal. He is perfecting me and he's doing it because it brings him glory. When Paul says, I boast in my weakness, he's being able to boast of the fact that I was unable to control my violence. But Christ through me has caused me to be a compassionate man. Yeah. He's able to boast and say that I was arrogant. I was one that for legalistic righteousness was flawless. And it was all to my shame because I did not know the power of Christ and his resurrection. He is, we are able to boast that we are nothing, but he is great. This causes a man to cry out, may I become less that he become more. This is by no means an excuse to sin. Amen. It's an awesome acknowledgement that he is greater than your sin. 
For the man that looks to him, his face will never be covered with shame. Church, we know the end of the story. We know what he said he will do with us. Let's not get caught up in despair because of the process. Look, we want to go to Ephesians 3, verse 7 through 10. And we want to highlight some things that all, all of us have read this passage. But we want to highlight some things that you might not have seen as you connect some verses together. Y'all want to do that? Yeah. Good. So good. <laughs> Come on, baby, make it hurt so good. Look, we love the message that we're preaching tonight because it's honestly how we live. Yeah. Uh, you'll know that this is not usually how you think of your own life or you know if you're not seeing yourself the way God sees you by how you react to difficulty and discipline and failure. If, you're, if your tendency is to respond with anger, I'm not talking about anger towards another person because you guys love the Lord. You know it's nobody else's fault why things are being revealed in your life. But if your tendency is to respond with anger towards yourself or anger towards the sovereignty of God or His timing, that just means you're not seeing things the way that God sees them means that you don't have his perspective. And tonight what we want is that every man can see things from the perspective that God sees. He called you specifically. Every person in this room, it, say I if you were in this room. I. That means you were the weakest. Yeah. That means you were the most needy. Yeah. I love you guys. Nobody who is on a shipwreck, stranded in the middle of the ocean, on the verge of succumbing to starvation and hydrate, dehydration, gets angry when a ship passes by the sea and saves them. Because they're so thankful they know what they're, they're in. They're desperate. And yet we get so angry at ourselves all of the time and so down and so frustrated. And we get in this, Gabriel said it perfectly, we get in this little circle of tying ourselves in knots of thinking, oh, I should be further along than this. Or everybody else is going to see me as something different. Or maybe God's extending another 10 years onto my time frame of my calling because of this ad attitude or season. No. That was a random example, right? <laughs> it is by design that he chose you with... <laughs> no. <laughs> it is by design I... that God chose you with the unique problems that you have. And as Brother Gabriel said it, it's not an excuse to keep doing it. But this he chose you with... So that he can help you get through it. So that you can be a demonstration of his power to the world. Otherwise, what demonstration would you be? I was awesome already and you can be awesome too? We know that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go to Ephesians 3. Verse 7. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. grace which was given me by the working of his power. Come on. We need to stop and think about that right there. Paul was made a minister according to the gift of what? You guys are smart. You know that Titus 2.11 says the grace of God has appeared to teach men to say no. You heard that we covered that in a recent message. How does it teach you to say no? You got to fail. You have to fall flat on your face and find the grace of God, the anointing of God, picking you up and teaching you how to not do that again. So when Paul says, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, you've got to understand that the process of him becoming a minister was a process of failing and getting back up and God getting glory through him being strengthened through his weakest moments. We like to read about of the Apostle Paul and think he was born the Apostle Paul. No, he was born Saul of Tarsus, a human being like you and I, a weak, ignoble man who God called him according to his grace. The same process that you and I are walking through. And that was given to him by the working of his power. Let's not make theological doctrines around that. What does it look like to have the working of his power inside of Paul? Means he has to be in despairing moments. Has to be in moments where he feels like nothing is working. Nothing is going to happen. His hope is being dashed to pieces. And in that moment, he's having a but the Lord moment. And the power of God is reviving him in the midst of it. Come on. Verse 8. 
to me, though I am the very least of all the saints. Don't think Paul's being false, uh, acting in false humility there. To me, though I am the very least of the saints. Is that how oft, do you often think of yourself as the very least of the saints? Why not? Paul did. Don't think of yourself high, more highly than you ought to, but with sober judgment. How sober in judgment should you be about yourself? Paul said, I am the very least of all the saints. But it doesn't stop there. This grace was given yeah. Come on. to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Amen. Again, this process of falling down and getting back up was given to me so I can preach unsearchable riches. Yeah. You and I like to skip to the part of unsearchable riches. Yeah, Paul's the man called to preach unsearchable riches. Paul, the unsearchable riches preacher of the gospel of Tarsus. No, there was a process involved in that. Verse 9, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Again, we like to think of Paul as a man who was a relayer of mysteries. A man called of God to get into the deepest levels of study and relay the mysteries of God. And he was, but there was a process. And what was that process for? Verse 10, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. I want you to connect verse 7 to verse 10. Paul is telling you that I was made a minister according to this process of grace being worked in me. I was made a minister through the process of weakness and resurrection. The process of dying to myself and resurrecting in real power. And I was made that minister so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. That means that Paul's mission was to be an example of the grace of God in his life. Being open and honest and transparent for everyone to see, I am Paul, the weak one. But his power is working inside of me. And by that process, the church itself learns to do what Paul did. And they learn to become a demonstration of weakness, growing into power, which leads to resurrection. And by that, they form a collection of men and women who are one family, who are showing the powers in the heavens that, yes, we are one body. We are weak. We are frail. We are fragile. We succumb to certain things. But his power is working inside of us to bring us to where we need to be. Church, you can see by God's design that that's why he chose us. So that we would be a... Dem Brother Gabe and I were talking. What do you think the heavenly powers were thinking when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden? And God, are you going to go down and destroy them? I mean, this whole Genesis, you know, this whole Tohu Vavohu thing, you know, you did that before. I, I knew for sure that that definitely wasn't going to work out, Lord. Yeah, how, how could you, Lord, take these weak creatures and cause them to walk in your fulfilled will? You know, it didn't work with the created things in the heavenlies. And then God's, God goes, oh yeah, watch this, heavenly powers. There's a side of me you haven't seen yet. I'm going to choose the weakest, and I'm going to make them strong, and I'm going to cause them to reign with me, and I'm going to atone for their sin. Church, you've got to have God's perspective about your life. And you've got to have God's perspective about how he chooses things in general. Otherwise, you just get angry and frustrated when you mess up. And that causes you to spiral downward into a cycle of getting angry and messing up more. But when you understand this process and you start to discover things and you have those eureka moments in your life, you go, you can look at each other and say, hey, man, this hurts. It hurts so good because it's bringing me into what he always intended for me to become. And that's a priest mediating on his behalf. We're going to go to Proverbs, but uh, by the Spirit of God and because we are family, there's something that I think the Lord wants to address in the room. When we think of Paul, we think of him as an amazing man of God, right? Yeah. The reason that we think of him this way is because of what the Lord showed him. Yeah. He thought of himself as the lowest of men the chief of all sinners, the least of the saints, 
the least of the apostles, and was honored to have received revelation from God. And we view him as great because of the revelation that he received. We, church, are not excluded from receiving the mysteries and revelations from God. If the least of all of the saints was revealed the ministry to the Gentiles and that we were included in it, then we got to be slightly higher than the least of all of the saints. We have to elevate our biblical study. Yeah. 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 I don't want to ask, when is the last time that you came to a scripture that you really did not understand? And you desperately wanted to search out the mystery that God had written in the book for you. That you prayed and you asked him to reveal it. That you did comparative study into other verses. You read commentaries and disagreed with them. You presented it to your brothers and you debated it until you found out the mystery of God. Our teaching in our church cannot be relegated to men like Carlos and Justin. I'm terrified for us that if all of us were required to recreate a foundation study, none of us would think we could do it. We do not go after the word like Paul. I may be the least of all the saints, but I know my God wants to reveal his mysteries to me. If all we can do is repeat teachings that we've heard, then we become redundant and we die. We have to search and mine the word of God for his mysteries. And what they will say of men like Rob. What they will say of Cody. What they will say of Ubong. When their time is up. Is that God was the revealer of mysteries to their life. And he, he included men in his ministry. Because of the revelation that God gave them. You can be the least of all of the apostles. The least of all the saints. And the chief of all sinners. And still receive revelation from God that changes the world. We just have to go after it. Yeah, that wasn't in our notes. And Gabe and I can feel by the spirit of God that there has got to be a level that rises in this room. Not just a surface level quoting of scripture. Not just a surface level interaction. Because what that does is produce a surface level revelation about God. And that only lasts so long. In fact, we get into these cycles where we don't really understand how God sees us or his entire perspective. It's because we spend so little time in the word of God and we're just happy with crumbs that fall from his table. We're sons of God. Yeah. Yeah. This book has been in existence for 3,000 years and yet it has not stopped producing fresh bread for the saints of God. Look at the last 20 or 25 years that LCM has been in existence and look at these sayings on these walls. And know that this is not the end. This is only the beginning. Yeah. There is more to be had. There is more revelation and more mystery to be explained. And it's not going to be through a select few. God is calling our deep interaction with the word to rise. And that deep interaction will occur in your life as much as you are willing to interact with it. It is a two-edged sword. It will cut you deeply. But the man that is willing to be cut by it will find... The resurrection power of God and he will find God speaking to him the deepest things that man can know. And it's not for the sake of knowing it. It's the sake of knowing him yeah, yeah. further. And when you know him, you know his perspective. When you know him, you actually get something like Proverbs 29, 18. And it's a protection for you. Proverbs 29, 18. Say, I heard so good when we get there. Where there is no revelation... The people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. Without vision, people cast off restraint. Without vision, everything is meaningless. Y'all ready for classic Gabe Stevens transparency? I am way too young to be having an existential crisis. But y'all with me and a little bit feeling like we... All gathered ourselves, we sold all, we did all to send the kibbutz. And then afterwards, it was a little bit like, what now? I. I began 
to wonder and to, to hate. But I had this feeling that like, I'm going to go to work and we're going to do this again. A client will complain. We'll fix it. The crew will do something. I'll sit here and I'll share the same words that I always do of encouragement. And at the end of the day, it will mean nothing for tomorrow. Feeling a little bit like I was just stuck in the same cycle. And I know I didn't have a right to complain because, well, good Lord, look around. We're as blessed as any people can be. It's because I had no vision. I had no reason to be doing what I was doing. And the Ephesian church was rebuked for forgetting their first love. And that's certainly part of it when you're... Doing things not out of a love for the Lord, it feels meaningless. But even if you really, really love him, and some of you really, really love him, but there's no point in what you're doing, you will get tired. You will get weary. You will cast off restraint and find something that entertains you. <laughs> Without revelation, men cast off restraint. Without vision, men cast off restraint. But what we have been talking about is the vision that the Lord has for our lives. And if you know how the Lord sees you. You know what the Lord wants to produce in your life. You know where he is sending you. Then you don't have some 50 year goal. That is ethereal out there somewhere in space. That one day you might get to. You have. I know that the Lord has called me to minister the gospel. I have this mezuzah in front of me. And. The way that I'm talking to my wife the last three days is deplorable. Yeah, that example was at random. The way that my wife is responding to me is deplorable. I hate these areas of my marriage. This is wicked and wrong, and it cannot produce the vision that the Lord has for me. So you know what? Today. Amen. Today, I'm going to put my foot on this Nabal trade. One of my Nabal traits is wrathful. It also mixes with insatiable and sadistic. It creates kind of a well, blender of a mouth on me that cuts and tears down even when I know the right thing that my wife should be doing. I still manage to somehow be so sharp, so cutting, and looking for pain rather than change that I muddy and ruin the direction that I was supposed to give in the first place. So... I need today, godliness with contentment is great gain. This is a step-by-step -step process that we're going to take day by day. And I can celebrate each little victory that I see happening in my wife's life. Because I want her to be a woman who is worthy of respect. And she is my princess, my queen, my battle ducky. I love every part of my wife. And like my God is perfecting me. I have a mission today for my wife. See, church, do you see how knowing the Lord's view of you, what he is making you into, gives you drive and meaning and vigor and fire for everything that you're doing in your day? It's not just one more fight with your wife. It's an opportunity to shape her into a weapon. It's not one more fight with my team. It's an opportunity for us to become like the mighty men. It is not one more sin that I have to deal with. It is my God perfecting me into a battle axe that cannot be stopped. See, every day becomes meaningful when you have vision. We need vision. And the Lord has given us vision. But in our pursuit to be perfect already we have forgotten what he intends to make us into see having vision produces purpose in your life and having purpose produces drive in your life when you have vision that is producing purpose that is producing drive every day fits into the larger puzzle piece of God's plan for your life you can look at those things and say man that are <laughs> wait wait I did what today? I was worshiping and then a guy cut me off in traffic while I was listening to that worship song and I said some words to him. Uh, how could that be in my heart? But I've discovered something that fits into the larger plan. It hurts, but it hurts so good because he is the master of the end goal. He's the one that's making this happen. See, without revelation, the people cast off restraint. When there is no vision, everything is meaningless. Also, when that vision feels like it's too far off, 
When that vision feels like it's never going to happen, well, it produces the same thing it did in the Israelites in Exodus 32, 5 through 6. Yeah. And where is that Moses fellow? I don't know. He's been gone a long time. Mostly dead. <laughs> you know, that, that guy who gives us vision, you know, and that vision, it might not be happening anymore. So verse 5 says, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. It's interesting that they called it a festival to the Lord. <laughs> you can see here, this is what it looks like to cast off restraint. I mean, literally. You could glean that they had no vision. They had no purpose. They had no drive what they're supposed to be doing that day. And so they cast off restraint. And they wanted to call it a festival to the Lord. It's funny to me how often we've lost vision. We don't know what we should be doing. Every opportunity that seems to point to where we need to grow hurts. And we're mad at it. And so we just start doing other things that are idolatrous and call it the Lord. Because we're bored. Because we're bored. God put me here and you know, that vision's a long time away. So I'm just going to do this for the Lord. The thing that really is difficult to glean from in this passage is that they actually rose early to sacrifice burnt offerings to this idol. Yeah. yeah. I have a problem waking up early. I just do. Yeah. But I've had times in my life where there is an idolatrous thing that I want to do. And man, I have all the fire in the world to wake up early to do that. Sure. You see, this is what casting off restraint looks like. This is what losing vision looks like. When you lose the perspective of God and what he's doing in your current day-to-day -day affairs, then you start to cast off restraint in small ways that become big ways. You find yourself pouring more energy to anything that is not the vision, the original vision that God had for you. You get up early to perform rebellion, and you're less diligent about the righteous vision that God gave you in the beginning than you are about your rebellion. Look, we're smart in this room and we're studied. We learn to think of idols as, you know, not so much carved things out of stone, but anything that we are giving attention to more than what the Lord has directed us to. I want to define idolatry as maybe uh, recreating or redefining who God is or forming a different God in your mind. How about, yeah, my calling's never going to happen. Really? Is, is, is God the type of God to promise you something and not fulfill it? How about, yeah, he's kind of cool with this because, well, he's not really performing his end of the deal by making my calling happen, happening or happen, so I can just do whatever I want right now. Yeah, see, we like to make God what we feel like we want him to perform for us in any given time. But let's talk about actual idols, things that in turn cause death. These idols we run to. Whenever we do not have vision for our life. Right now, if you have idolatry in your life, if you are hooked on Netflix more than you are on your Bible, the answer is not to just repent and sob, uh, sob everywhere. The answer is to get more vision about what God wants to perform in your life. Okay? This too, this part of crucifying, this part of ridding you of idolatry, guess what? It's also the part of the process of becoming priests. Hurts How so do you... Good. How do you know how to mediate for God on behalf of an idolatrous world if you have not encountered the grace of God to crucify your own idols? See, all of this was a process that Israel had to go through, and it hurt, but it hurt so good because it was getting them one step closer to where God wanted them to be. We're going to go to Acts 18, starting in verse 24 through 26, and we will keep our pace. Are y'all bored? They hurt so good when you get there. This one is also going to hurt so good. <laughs> but in a fun way. <laughs> Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, 
though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So, y'all are familiar with Priscilla and Aquila, right? We've heard these names. Yeah. Right, so don't go to sleep on me because we've heard these names. Are they fivefold ministers? They are not labeled as fivefold ministers. They're labeled as a godly family. I don't know. Much like godly families in here. So we can't just throw them up on a shelf somewhere to say that they're in a different category than me. This is a husband and wife with their children in a body of God, just like this one. Who did they run into? Y'all remember the descriptors of Apollos? A learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scripture who had been instructed and taught in the way of the Lord. Who taught him the way more accurately? You mean a normal family in the church was able to train a five-fold minister in the way of God more accurately? The kind of man that was able to debate Pharisees in the synagogue and win? What kind of vision should we have for our lives? We don't get to throw them in another category. We don't get to say that this is someone else. They worked alongside Paul, but they were tent makers. They were normal, ordinary family in love with the Lord, and they were able to instruct him more accurately in the ways of God. So I have a question for you. And as I said, it's going to hurt so good. The question I've been asking myself for months is if a new believer, I did evangelism, they came off of the street because the Lord caused me to speak to them, or more so because I know what the Lord has called me to do. If a new church plant, if a new believer had only my life as an example for how the scripture is walked out accurately, how well off would he be? It's a question I think that it's worth asking the heads of households. If not just somebody, but somebody that would be responsible for planting ministries, working alongside Paul, and refuting Pharisees on a daily basis like it was eating grapes, walked into your home for you to be the example of how scripture is lived out, how well would you do? How well would that disciple do? See, we have to elevate our study. Amen. We have to elevate the way that we live. We can't keep putting these things on a shelf for someone else. Priscilla and Aquila did it. While we're thinking about this, we can't say for sure. I am admitting that up front. But turn with us to 1 Timothy 3, starting in verse 3. It is our supposition, a possibility, that Paul wrote this thinking about Priscilla and Aquila. Because he was working with this godly family on a regular basis. And Paul, not having a wife or children of his own, would be looking at a godly example of what a family should look like. Before we do that quickly, we need to talk about why this is important we're sharing this. Okay? We've learned in this room that we're not reaching for titles. We're not reaching for some kind of status. We're not supposed to. But so, all, we kind of still do. You know, we like to evaluate certain callings in the room or let me just make it real for you guys. Oh, that brother has found his team. Oh, that brother's married and I'm single. Or that brother knows what country he's called to and I don't. Or that brother's called to be a teacher, but that one's called to be an apostle. As if one is better than the other. As if we're not in one body and each part of the body is equally important and valued by God and given to the body for the, the mutual edification of the body. We like to pit these titles against each other and use them as a way to evaluate our own value. And then, say if we don't 
per, uh, perceive that we have that same kind of value excuse ourselves from the process of having to go through the same thing and become the same type of Christian. You see, we all too often look at someone like, I love Pastor Wade. We go, you know, Pastor Wade's a pastor. You know, he, he should live that way, but I'm not a pastor. Or I'm not called to be a... No, you are called to walk as Pastor Wade walks. Pastor Wade has a function by God to be responsible for this body, but you are called to walk in the same way. So as we get into this passage in 1 Timothy 3, we're going to show you, it says overseers, there's something you need to know about that word. That word overseer means an overseer, but it also simply means to look over something, like to have vision about something. You guys want to be people who have vision about something? Then you got to understand that it's possible that Paul's writing this because he saw an ordinary, I'm going to say ordinary in the kingdom family that didn't possess a title that we really know about. People that he called his co-workers often in his letters. People that he traveled with and he might be gleaning something about what this family is becoming and telling people that if you desire to be a person who has vision about the body of God, vision for your own life, vision to look over, like see over something, then you're going to have to walk like these people. What we want to do is leave nobody excused from this room of these examples because you feel like you might not be called to a, a, a specific function. No, this is, the t this is what we are all becoming, kind of like God telling the nation of Israel that you are called to be a nation of priests together. As we read this, we are going to share this with you as this is the goal for every single person in this room. So you have to listen and you have to look at it and go, that's what I am going to become. And that's what God wants me to become. Amen. You guys with us? Yes. Let's go over the Lord's vision for your life. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, to look over something, to have sight over something, to have vision. He desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. We're not going to take forever on each one of these. To be the husband of but one wife. We're not going to go into a two-hour teaching that we just went through in this church about this not being about a widower and all of those things. Praise God. It is a one-woman kind of man. Yeah. It is someone who has eyes only for his wife. Yeah. Let's be honest, men. Can you say that your eyes, your desires, your thoughts, your inclinations are only for one woman? Do we allow, I don't know, YouTube shorts to put 14 or 15 images of different women that, you know, you scrolled past them, you didn't look at it, you didn't linger on it, but you now have but your you eyes to. on 14, yeah, you wanted to, you have your eyes with 14 different women in your head now? See, we need to be men who are wholeheartedly committed to our wives. Amen. We must be temperate and self-controlled. Well, I just talked to y'all about my particular failings in that area. We can't be men that cut away more than we build while we're attempting to give direction. Respectable. Well, I'm going to leave that to y'all's study because we all have different definitions of respectable. But we know what a respectable man like Baj looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Hospitable and able to teach. You must be practicing hospitality. This is setting our table and able to teach. We're not talking about just sharing a scripture that you found encouraging. We're talking about if Apollos is sitting at your table, you can teach him. Yeah. These are requirements of people who have vision for something. Let's move on to verse three. We're gonna start rifling through these things. You guys with us? Yeah. Yeah. Verse three says that we should not be given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Again, this is God's vision for what you are becoming. So can you praise God a little bit for the time that God is taking to make you into a person who doesn't love money? Can you see God working that into your life? I know I can. 
or making you a person that's not quarrelsome. How many situations have you found yourself in where you're like, I'm not going to say it. Now I'm going to say it. You see, God is, I'd like. yeah. God is teaching you how to become like Priscilla and Aquila. He's bringing you through the process of becoming a nation, a body of priests. What does verse 4 say? He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? I think it's funny that we gave the guy without kids this particular one, but I'm going to sta- take a stab at it anyways. Take a stab at it, brother. The way that I've been thinking about this, and we've been talking about it in my team, is our Apollos example. If you had somebody whose only example for parenting was your parenting, how happy would you be with their results? See, we need to be these kind of fathers and husbands, but this is the Lord's vision for us. We want to be active participants in his vision, but this is a you shall, a language of the law, Rabbi Triester, yeah. that you shall be this kind of man. Check out verse 6. Y'all, you guys are going to love this one. He must not be a recent convert. I don't know what recent means, but there's some purpose in God's timing to this. If your life expectancy was two years after being born again, <laughs> recent's a little different. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Again, we're presenting this passage as don't excuse yourself from it. This is what you need to grow into. You need to be looking at these things in your life and evaluate, am I growing? But you also need to know that God is making you into these things. Don't look at timing as a problem for your call to be fulfilled. The word says he must not be a recent convert. And God is the one who decides how recent he wants that to be. God is allowing room, room, uh, time and room in your life so that you don't become conceited. Praise God God that he's a faithful God that will not allow us to become conceited. He's not going to allow us to become conceited priests. And he is good to carry on his mighty works in your life and give enough time for, uh, for him to work out those. And it can't happen in a day. It's a process of rooting out. Ask me how I know. (laughs) I walked into this room one day a while ago, and a very wonderful person of God came up to me and said, you are arrogant, right before worship started. I'm like, thank you so much. I am always looking for areas I can grow. And you know what I worked on after that? Not being arrogant. Being who I'm called to be, but not being arrogant. You see, God is good to us. He is allowing us to become pure priest who will not fall under that judgment. Verse 7. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. It's a trap. (laughs) We've all seen Google reviews. A good reputation is not made overnight. Thank God for work Judah did before we took over FCR. (laughs) See, there is a process to this. But we cannot exclude our necessity to participate in it every day. How do you build a good reputation? Well, you got to show up to work on time every day. You've got to be dependable. You've got to be somebody who's capable of absorbing new information. All of the things you wrote on your resume that you don't do. You have to build a good reputation. And this is part of what the Lord's vision is for every man in this room. And we can actively participate in what the Lord is doing. Deacons, those who handle the finances, those who handle serving other people in the body, well, they are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. Have you found some dishonest gain that you're craving at some point in your life? Have you found the need... Uh, to present respect, but you don't really, you're not really a respectable person, or yes. have you found areas of your life where you're not as sincere as you would like to be? Yes. Praise God. It hurts so good. He is revealing these things to you so that you can get it right. He's revealing it to you so that you can become someone who has vision for something. Verse 9. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. 
They must first be tested. Then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Uh, who are my buddies that just did a Hebrew final? Yeah, the testing hurts so good. See, why am I being tested? I brought this revelation to my pastors and they said, we'll see. No, they didn't immediately agree with me. See, it hurts so good that the Lord tests us before he gives us authority. He's teaching you how to hold to the deep truths of faith, but not just to have the deep truths, to hold on to them with a clear conscience. Well, that takes some work, doesn't it? Man, thank God he's giving time for that to occur in our lives. Here's the next one, verse 11. In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect. Not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. If you're hearing that and you're going, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, praise God. He's allowing room for you as husbands to build these things into your wives. And I got to say, we have some amazing wives in this room. I'm pretty fond of mine. Don't think for a second that these things are not already being built in your life. God brought you here to build them into your life. And it hurts so good sometimes. You're like, I wish I didn't uh, identify that in my family. And then the next week, you're like talking to a brother and you're like, yeah, I went through that last week. It hurt. But now I'm getting victory. Let me share that with you. Hurts so good. Verse 12. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife. I won't make Joe go through that one again. And he must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. Church, service to the Lord, participating in vision, will give you confidence and surety for the days to come. You've never met men more confident like our pastors, like my father. And much of that comes through the fact that they know they've been serving him for 20, 30 years. Regardless if men walked away, regardless if they had a bad day, regardless if they felt like they were doing a good job. And so they're going to still be doing this in another 30 years no matter what happens. We hope so. He who serves well grains excellent standing and great assurance in their faith. You ought not be terrified every day if you're going to make it if you died. You ought not be terrified every day that you're failing because you're doing what he called you to do. You have vision for your day. This is that question. If they were looking at you, how well would they do? This should cause us to have intention and intensity in our personal growth. It's not an option for us to sit on the surface of the scripture anymore. It's not an option for us to sit on the surface of our development of our families. JJ is a man that I think works harder and more effectively on the development of his family than anybody I've ever seen. It convicts me regularly. He works hard. He works like a mule. Makes me look bad. I'm huffing and puffing on our fourth or fifth trip and he's still going. What is... More impressive than that is he not only does that, but there's never a day that he doesn't have mission and vision for his family. He has set up disciplines that cause him to develop his family on a daily basis. And it's something I'm trying to emulate in my life. We have to be intentional with the development of our families. If you winced when it said that their wives should be respectable, develop your family. We can't sit on the surface in our participation in service and in evangelism. This is not meant to just stay in this room. I'm stealing it from Devin Hutchinson because I can't remember who he quoted it from, but a church that doesn't evangelize, fossilize. We have to develop here, and we can't now go to a grocery store and act like you don't have the solution to the world's problems and that the Lord doesn't have vision for the person in front of you and vision for what you're supposed to be doing. Same applies in here. We get used to the same person gives a prophecy in tongues. The same person interprets it. We play the same worship songs and then we go into the next prayer. Perhaps God would like to do something in that moment. And we need to open our eyes to vision for daily intentional growth and process. This should also cause your faith to grow. That this is what God wants for you and for all of his kingdom. This 1 Timothy 3 is what he is making you into. This will be true. If you were going to have an epitaph, if you're going to have a stone that was chiseled out, 
you will have this written on it. Faithful to his one wife. That his wife was respectable. That he was able to teach. That he had a good reputation with outsiders. That he was temperate and that he was self-controlled. This is what is going to be the testimony of every family in this church. Yeah. As we are coming to a close. Sorry. No. That, that was good. And that's why I'm saying what, what I'm about to say. As we're coming for a close, we can feel that repentance needs to occur in the room. That's the aim of every message. That's why we preach is because we always are seeking to repent. We have a feeling that repentance needs to occur, but not really for any of the things that you're not doing that you should be doing. You know, we read that passage to you in Timothy because we want you to know that this is what God is growing you into. This is the kind of families that God is growing you into. We believe that a deeper kind of repentance needs to happen. A deeper kind of repentance that's based on Psalm 103, verses 11 through 14. We have two more passages. You guys with us? It says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He knows how we were put together. He was the one who built us. He knows the nails that went into the boards to make us who we were. He knows our foundation. He remembers that we are dust. When you hear the part that says he removes our transgressions from us, are you sitting here thinking, well, that's kind of nice, but I don't really feel like he does that? My transgressions feel like they're up to my neck. The reason you feel that way is because you've lost vision and you've lost God's perspective for several reasons, your interaction with the word, your interaction with him personally. But we need you to gain God's perspective about your life in this moment. When it says he removes your transgression from, from you, it means he removes your transgression from you. It means he removes it to Come such on. an extent that he forgets about it completely. And yet we seem to always remember every single one of our failures. Don't have a better memory than God. You need to understand something. What business would God have remembering your sin and always keeping you in your sins and in your failures? What glory would he gain from your perpetual suffering and failure? What kind of God would have his subjects constantly living in a state of being afraid to try and grow. He doesn't do that. He is a God that has called the shot from the beginning. And he has declared what you will become. What business do you have? Bringing yesterday's failures into today. What business do you have? Thinking that your failures are storing up. A failure in God to bring, up his, bring about his promise for your life. See, we learned that we are to be jealous for what God's jealous about. You need to be more jealous about God's calling in your life than you are pitying yourself about your own state. See, I am jealous for the will of God in your life. And when you speak about yourself in lesser terms than what God has declared you are, what God said you will become, that makes me angry. Because you're speaking against my God and my Father and His ability to carry about His promises for you. You're speaking about my friend who knew what you were in the beginning and called you anyway so that he can work with you through it so that he can get the glory out of it. Don't refuse to give glory to God by staying in a failure because you believe that has eliminated you in His eyes from your calling. Come on. It's a part of the process in every man's life to feel the weight of the cross in his heart and rely on his grace to strengthen him and grow. And when you see that in hindsight, you go, that was his will the entire time that I learned this. And you start to really get it and it clicks together when you're surrounded by other people who are struggling with the same thing. And you go, oh, I know. I was there. I experienced the same thing. But let me tell you about his grace working in me. What business does God, King of the universe, have in keeping you in perpetual failure? 
What glory would he get? What would his name be like if he just had a church that could never be free? That is not my king. That is not my master. My master has called each and every one of you to walk as he said that you can walk and as he said he will make you walk. The deep repentance that we need to have is thinking so little of God and thinking so much of us and our performance. We have to understand that it was God who called us at our weakest state and that didn't change 10 years down the road when you find more weakness. That didn't change 20 years down the road when you found more weakness there. All you are finding is the glorious hand of God leading you into further progression into becoming these things. Church, it's time to rise up. It's time to stand to your feet. It's time to fix our eyes on the vision that God has said that we do know about and stop playing games and pretending like it's not going to happen. It's time to run with the vision of God. Yeah. Our last passage Gabriel's going to share with us, and it comes with Psalm, from Psalm 119, verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your promise gives me life. Church, he will not waste one of your mistakes. Amen. He will not waste one of your mistakes before the kingdom or in the kingdom, because it's his promise Psalm 25 says, for your name's sake, forgive my iniquity, even though it is great. It is for his name that he forgives you. It is for his name that he has called you. It is for his name that he makes you into what he desires. That is his promise to you. So we can confidently face failure and say, my God's not going to waste this one either. Man, it hurts so good. Father, we want to thank you for this evening. Lord, we want to uplift your holy name. Lord, we want to confess that we have thought too much of ourselves, too much of our failure, and too little about your sovereignty, your vision, and your ability to create us into what you want, to make out of nothing and to form out of something. Lord, use your word, use your hands, and remove from us as far as the east is from our, the west our iniquity. That we might find your vision for our lives.